Hello. Assalamu alaikum. That's better. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. This beautiful place, all these smart people. Um, very grateful. My first trip to Istanbul. Um, very great to be here. My name is Scott Davison, and I teach at uh, Moorhead State University in the United States, which is in Kentucky. Do you know Kentucky? <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken? Um, John Ayer says, I have the same beard. The same beard. Do you think maybe I look the same? Maybe now? <laughs> A little bit? I have uh, difficulty uh, teaching with my students because they don't know if I'm joking or telling uh, serious, so I have uh, uh, help for them. So if I tell a joke, I use this card that says laugh. <laughs> and then if my lecture goes away or I make a mistake, I have the card that says sorry. Okay, this is going to be okay. Very good. So there are some questions I will talk about today. What is really valuable? Would God create a world like ours? Or is our world too evil? What can science tell us about these things? Is the natural world all by itself a valuable thing? These are some of the questions I will talk about. I can't get into every argument that people would like to discuss, but I will try to give an overview of some pictures on these things and try to be helpful, and maybe we can have some more conversation if you like. And always, you may email me if you want to discuss more, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, what do humans actually value? What do humans find valuable? What do they, what do they care about? This is a question that science can answer. We can study people to discover what they actually value, right? A different question is, what should humans value? What is objectively valuable or good? This is a different kind of question altogether. And it seems to me that science cannot answer this question. Science can answer related questions, questions in the neighborhood, but not exactly the question of what should we value. It can tell us what we do value, but not what we should value. What would God value? This, I think, is a different kind of question. And I think this is a question we need to ask if we want to discover or explore the problem of evil. The problem of evil, of course, is an argument against the existence of God, probably the strongest argument against the existence of God. So if we want to explore this, we need to have some idea about what God would value. What things do humans actually value? I will mention just a few things here because they are familiar to you because you are all humans. So, for instance, we value the needs of other humans, especially the ones in our group. We are different from, say, uh, snakes, where they are born self-sufficient, they don't rely on each other, they don't need to learn, they, they go. They're born and they go. Humans are different. We need each other, right? On the plane from New York to Istanbul, there was a baby crying. And scientists tell us there are at least three different ways that babies cry. Do you know this? So one way is the normal way. The baby cries a little bit, and then pause, and then cries some more. Sorry. Sorry. My glasses get in the way. Um, so the baby cries and then pause, and then cry some more. That's the normal way. The second way is when the baby is angry. When the baby is angry, the baby cries and pause, and then cries very loud. And the baby on the airplane from New York City to Istanbul was angry, very loud. But I could tell, I have three children, I could tell it was angry, baby, so I could put in earphones and ignore this angry baby. But the third cry is the cry of pain. And when the baby cries with pain, the baby cries 
and then stops and holds its breath. And there's a long pause. And then baby cries really loud. And human beings cannot ignore the cry of the baby in pain. So if on the airplane this had been the baby crying in pain, everybody would have been very upset. But it was just the angry baby, so it was fine. Do you know what I'm talking about, parents? You hear the cry of pain, you drop everything, right? It tears your heart apart, the cry of babies in pain, right? So these are things that all humans value. We know the difference between the baby in pain and the baby that's mad. We are always noticing resources like food and water. We see these things. We look at the world and we uh, classify things as being resources for us. Those are things we value. We also value things that are near to us in space and time. We don't think very far into the future. And this is a problem for global climate change, right? Because I am planning for maybe six months or one year global climate change is coming longer, right? I also plan for things that are near me. I don't always plan for things that are far away or people who are not close to me. So these are human beings and these are some of the things they value. What does God value? Well, God's values are going to be different, right? So for instance, instead of valuing the needs of other humans the way we do, the ones that are in our group, I think we should say God values the needs of all creatures because God knows the needs of all the creatures and God creates all the creatures, not just us. So God has a bigger scope of concern than ours. Also, instead of valuing those resources that we value as humans, God values all things of all kinds. But God doesn't need food or air or water the way we do, right? And instead of things that are near in space and time, God knows all of space and all of time, the whole history of the universe, right? So God's perspective on things is quite different. I cannot ignore, I cannot think when I hear the baby crying in pain. I I am sure that God also is moved by the baby crying in pain, but not the same way, because God knows what's coming in the future and what's happened in the past. It's different, right? God is different. Is anything objectively valuable? Is there anything that's valuable for its own sake? Um, This is a question about value theory. I want to talk about science briefly and the limits of science, and then I want to jump into value theory for a while, and then I want to come back to science. Okay, so science is designed to explain and control the world around us, right? That's what science does. And uh, in the last lecture, we had a very helpful description of the history of science and religion together and when science became, the natural science became uh, important with medicine and technology. Although there are some areas of science that share blurry boundaries with pure theory, like mathematics and physics, Scientific evidence is always connected to observation of the physical world. That's what makes it scientific. So to confirm or disconfirm a theory, you have to make an observation, do a test, right? You have to do a test. That's what makes it science. So that's a good thing about science, that you can do a test and observe and record the result. That makes science something we can share with other people but it's also a limitation on science because the evidence for science must be connected to our observation, our senses, right? Science can tell us how the world is, but going back to the previous point, it can't tell us how the world should be. The way the world should be is a question for ethics or value theory. So it's a limitation of science. Science is wonderful. Science does great things for us. Science helps us explain and Uh, predict the world, right? But it can't tell us how the world should be. And that's going to be important later when we talk about the problem of evil. Is anything objectively valuable? Well, continuing on about science, science can help us to decide which means to pursue in order to achieve a certain end. But it can't tell us which ends are worth pursuing. So maybe science can help us 
to arrange the world so that people get along better with less war and more peace. But science can't tell us that peace is better than war. Science is about the means, but not the ends, not the goals, right? Science might be able to help us discover what humans need to flourish together, but it cannot tell us how much we should value the goal of flourishing together. The goals come from somewhere else. Maybe science helps us to achieve those goals, but science can't tell us what the goals should be. We get that from someplace else. And so science can't tell us whether anything is objectively valuable or not. That is a philosophy question, and that's a value theory issue. So that's where I want to go with you into some value theory and explain how that makes a difference when we evaluate the problem of evil. There are values that go with science, and in order to practice science, you have to share these values. And I think this, this is important and interesting when you study the way science works. So for instance, explaining and predicting things is a value that science has. Being rational is a value that science has, right? Uh, weighing the evidence rationally and not emotionally. The value of simplicity in a theory is important. Here's an illustration of simplicity, right? This is the one that works. <laughs> These other ones don't work. But just because there are values like that that are part of science, that doesn't show that those values are objectively grounded. It just means that the practice of science requires those values. Every practice requires some values to make it work. So even though these values are intrinsic to science, you might say we can't do science without these values, that doesn't show by itself that those values are objectively grounded. To show that a value is objectively grounded is more difficult than that. So if science can't answer this question, science really shouldn't say anything either way, right? Science should stay out of this debate about what is objectively good and bad. It should. And scientists should stay out of the debate. Some scientists are very clear about this, and they say so. We don't investigate what's valuable objectively. They say, that's not what we do. And that's good. But what about the value of the physical universe itself? Is there value to the physical universe itself? The usual scientific answer, if you read the scientists who talk about this, if they say anything, they say, the universe is not good, it's not bad, it just is. So it's neutral, right? Have you heard astronomers say this? It's not good, it's not bad, it just is. Here's a quote from a famous uh, person who came up in the last lecture, Richard Dawkins. It's not exactly the same point, but it's very close. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So he's saying the universe is just neutral, right? It just is. And I think this is a common view among scientists. But that is not a neutral view. To say that the universe is neutral is not a neutral view. It's taking a stand on the value of the universe, right? The idea that the matter itself is not good or bad, it's actually a really substantive philosophical conclusion about the nature of the world. And it's one that I think is actually false. And it's not a scientific question, again, whether the universe has value objectively. Philosophers disagree very sharply about everything, of course. <laughs> Making sure you're paying attention. Right? They disagree about everything, and they disagree about this quite a bit. So the view that I will defend here today is a view that most philosophers don't share, and maybe you will think it's a crazy view, and that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. But I will try to explain it clearly so that if you do disagree with me, you will understand why. Okay? If we are trying to decide whether or not our world is the sort of world that God might create, we need to explore this question. It's relevant to the problem of evil. What kind of world do we have? Do we have a world that's good? Or do we have a world that's neutral? 
or do we have a world that's bad, right? So we're going to dive into value theory a little bit, and uh, we're going to jump into this area and swim around a little bit and then come back to the problem of evil and then I will be done, okay? We can't do a complete tour of value theory. You can only do, they say, the tip of the iceberg. You know this phrase? Just the beginning, right? Just the tip of the iceberg. We will be talking about some material that I have published other places. So I have a book called The Intrinsic Value of Everything, and then a paper on the problem of evil in the Oxford uh, Studies in Philosophy of Religion. Again, I won't try to convey all the details of those arguments, but I will be talking about some of those things as we go. Now, there is more than one way in which things could be objectively valuable. I'm going to talk about one way, but there, you should know there could be other ways, lots of other ways. I won't try to survey the ways. One way involves the idea of intrinsic value. I'm a fan of the idea of intrinsic value. Most philosophers, I think, are not, but I think I have a good explanation why. The idea of intrinsic value is the idea that something is good in itself, apart from the relations it has to any other things. <clears throat> Maybe the physical world has some degree of intrinsic value all by itself. This is the conclusion I want to defend briefly to you, and then I want to back up and say what difference would that make to the problem of evil, and what does science tell us about this, okay? Uh, there are some slides I'm going to skip because I don't have enough time to talk about all of them, okay? Um, but I think you have access to the PPT if you want to look at this later. Uh, so there are just a few slides I'm going to go through quickly, okay? Uh, the reason why I think a lot of people are not um, fans of the idea of intrinsic value has to do with a bit of history. You might have heard of the movement called logical positivism in Western philosophy around the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the logical positivists said that uh, in order to be meaningful, a statement had to be verifiable. And sometimes you will still hear, hear scientists talk this way. If you can't test a statement, it's not meaningful, they will say. Um, that's not true. Uh, that statement itself can't be tested. It fails its own test. So, uh, but the influence of this movement continues, and the idea of uh, value statements at all was something the logical positivists just threw out. They said all of ethics is meaningless. All of metaphysics is meaningless. Science is meaningful. So we still live under the ghost of this movement, I think, in science and in value theory. They are skeptical about the idea of objectivity and of value in general. They draw a sharp distinction between facts and values. Facts are verifiable, values are subjective. I think this is a mistake that we need to get over, but it's just difficult because it's so influential. So we're doing our best. Some people think that values can't be objective and that that's a scientific conclusion. Uh, we've already seen that's not right. That's not possible. So I want to explain here the idea of intrinsic value the way I defend it in my book, and then see if you want to follow me. Uh, if I was teaching a class, I would have a little way to uh, do a, an instant poll to see if you agree with me or not, but I don't, my software only counts like 20 votes, so it's not enough. So um, I don't, I don't know how to take your poll. I could ask you to raise your hand, but that puts you on the spot. So what is the idea of intrinsic value? First of all, I think if you believe in God, you are committed to something that's intrinsically valuable because God has to be intrinsically valuable. The value of God is not something instrumental. It doesn't depend on how useful God is to anybody. The value of God is intrinsic. God has the value that God has intrinsically. So. I think that's one thing that we can all agree on. The next question, though, is whether there are any created things that have this kind of value. Is it a value that God can share with creatures, or is it a value that only God can possess? And that's the question that I want to turn to now. I think you know where I'm headed. Um, this is a slide for philosophers. People talk about different objects that can be the bearers of intrinsic value, but I'm not going to talk about that. There are other kinds of value that we should distinguish from intrinsic value, just to be clear. So for instance, intrinsic value is not the same as instrumental value. 
Instrumental value is the value of a thing to be able to accomplish something. So suppose I have two knives, and one of them is sharp, and the other one is dull. The sharp knife has more instrumental value because I can use it to cut things, and the dull knife doesn't work. So that's one kind of value that's different from intrinsic value, the value of instruments. Also, there is the idea of economic value. Here are two paintings. One is the original self-portrait of Rembrandt, and the other is a forgery, a fake. I, th I think the one on the right is the original, but I don't remember. One of them is fake. But uh, the one that's original has economic value that the fake does not. Right? So if the experts agree, this is the fake one, the fake one is not worth millions of dollars, but the original one is. Right? So there's economic value. That's not the same as intrinsic value. And there's also sentimental value. Here's a picture of a man who collects string. He winds the string into a big ball. He cares about the ball of string. It's the world's largest ball of string. He likes it so much, he built a cover, roof over it. See this? He's got a, a shelter for the ball of string. It has sentimental value for him. He has feelings for the string. Does that make the string intrinsically valuable? No, it just means he likes it, right? He's a strange man. He's the string guy. He just collects the balls of string. So there are at least these different kinds of value. The intrinsic properties of a thing, I want to define intrinsic value, are the properties that it has all by itself, apart from relationships it has to other things. So this statue here, a famous statue of the thinker, has the following intrinsic properties, being made of bronze, being shaped like a man, being inflexible. Those are intrinsic. If we had a machine that could duplicate things, like a copy machine for objects, and we put the statue in there, and ran it through, we would have two statues, and they would have exactly the same intrinsic properties. They would have all those internal properties in common. By contrast, the extrinsic properties are the properties the statue has only because it's related to other things. They aren't properties that it has in itself. If I run the statue through the copy machine, these are gonna have different extrinsic properties because they're gonna stand in different relationships to other things. One will be the original, one will be the copy, one will be over here, one will be over there. And so they will have different extrinsic properties. Being heavy, having been sculpted by the artist Rodin, being located in France, being rare and important, these are all extrinsic properties of that statue. So those are not internal to the statue. Not every in intrinsic property is essential to the statue, for instance, the property of being made of bronze is intrinsic and essential to that statue. But the property of having this little piece right here, see that little piece? If that broke off, you know, if somebody damaged the statue, it would still be the same statue, right? So not everything that's intrinsic is essential. It looks like the intrinsic value of something can vary then. It varies by degrees. The intrinsic value is not essential to it. It could change over time. This is a picture of a mosquito that uh, I found on my office window. And uh, he, he is now dead. But the day before, he was alive, flying around. So he had more intrinsic value yesterday when he was alive than he does now. He's lost intrinsic properties. His body doesn't function any longer. He's become a dead mosquito, right? This is a statue of... Uh, Victory, you know this, Nike, the winged victory in Athens? Uh, it used to have a head, right? I think it was more intrinsically valuable when it had a head. It might have other properties that are better because it lost its head, but I think intrinsically, it makes sense to say it would be better with its head. This is a fertilized egg. Uh, I don't, this is a photograph, not my photograph. Um, but, you know, I have three children, so maybe, maybe once one of my children was a fertilized egg. I'm not sure. But that, the intrinsic value of a person changes over time, right? So you acquire new uh, value as you develop your capacities, and then you lose them. Um, so if I want to define intrinsic value, it's something like 
being intrinsically valuable is having intrinsic properties that would provide a reason to value something for its own sake. It would provide a reason, a ground, a basis, an objective reason. Um, so I, I want to say that it's intrinsically valuable if and only if it would be valued for its own sake on the basis of its intrinsic properties by a fully formed, properly functioning person. And I want to explain these two pieces of what it is uh, to be a good valuer so you can see where I'm going with this. So for instance, a fully informed person knows all the relevant facts. This is not something that an actual person uh, ever achieves, but we only approximate it. We get closer and closer to being fully informed. We are never fully informed. God would be fully informed. A properly functioning person has a history of proper training and value, a history of proper reflection on value, a properly disinterested stance regarding the object so they're not invested personally, and so on. That's a normative idea that people only approximate. So we are not perfect valuers, but we have the idea of what a good valuer would value if they were fully informed and properly functioning. Now, I can't prove that intrinsic value exists. I've just defined it for you. So don't take my word for it. You don't have to believe me. I don't, I'm just telling you what it is. Now, the next question is, is there anything like that in the world besides God? You can't prove that that exists, but you can't prove that it doesn't either. It's not something you can prove. It's a philosophy problem. It's a, it's a value theory problem. The best you can do is to consider the alternative pictures and decide where the evidence points. It's like science in that we're weighing theories and trying to see where the evidence leads us. So let me consider with you the three possibilities that I think we should really look at carefully. Maybe nothing has intrinsic value at all except for God. I think this is the common scientific assumption. And again, this is not a scientific conclusion, but they still have a view about this. I think that's the most common view. The second idea would be that some things have intrinsic value, but other things don't. You see this little glow around the cactus? That's the, the cactus has intrinsic value. The third possibility is that everything that exists has some kind of intrinsic value, including the cactus and the rock and everything else. I want to compare these pictures a little bit and talk about the evidence. I'm just summarizing the case here, and then I'll jump out of value theory, and I'll see if you agree with me. I could be a little more precise in my description of the options. So here, if I've created a graph, this is the idea that nothing has any intrinsic value at all. The second possibility is that everything has intrinsic value to the highest degree possible. So every little point on the graph is saturated with that blue color, which would be intrinsic value. Maybe the third possibility, some things are intrinsically valuable, but other things are not. And so you would have the second picture with the cactus, but not the rest, right? Or the one I like best, everything that exists has some intrinsic value, no matter how small. So it fades down to nothing when you reach non-existence. That's the view I think is the best one. I'm just going to gesture at why I think that's the best one. I do think this is a very simple view, the idea that nothing else has intrinsic value besides God. I think it's very simple. It treats everything the same. It's clean. Uh, I like it. I think it's the best alternative, but I don't believe it, and here's why. Um, let me give you an argument. Suppose you had a machine, we already have machines like this, a machine that's called a destroyer, and the destroyer takes something like an apple and it squashes it into bits. This is like a trash compactor, right? Now, suppose you have a different kind of machine that's called a annihilation machine. And what this does is it makes the object disappear completely, so none of its parts exist at all. It, it's completely gone. How could we do this, you might say? Well, I don't know. Maybe we could use antimatter. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. It's just a hypothetical machine. But maybe we could imagine what this would be like, right? So something is completely annihilated. Well, what would a fully informed, properly functioning valuer say about the accidental annihilation of a human person? Suppose a human person climbed into the annihilation machine and it was activated by mistake and the person disappeared. This is a picture of my daughter. 
when she was about four years old. She has a lot of style, flair at this age. Now, not so much. She's a teenager now. It's okay, you can laugh. She would laugh. She would laugh with you. It's okay. Don't feel bad. It's okay. So what if, what if my daughter climbed into the machine and then she was annihilated? Uh, how should we feel about that? Well, there's all kinds of values at stake here. So I have sentimental value because it's my daughter, right? Sentimental value. Maybe there's economic and instrumental value. But is there intrinsic value too? Does the universe lose something of intrinsic value when a human being is annihilated? I think I want to say yes. It's bad. It's bad if a human person is annihilated. And it doesn't have to be my daughter. It could be a total stranger. I just have a picture of her. Uh, here's a philosopher who thinks that a human being is a pretty magnificent kind of machine. And, and, uh, but his point is that a human being has intrinsic value. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that we want there to be in the world, not to be gone. So if you imagine this uh, fully informed, properly functioning valuer, what would they think about the difference between before and after in this difference in the way the world is? I think that the valuer would say that we've lost something of value here. We've lost a, a human being, and that's bad. Uh, and, and it's intrinsically bad. So we've lost something of intrinsic value. That seems like the natural thing to me to say. Um, you don't have to say that, but it seems like a natural thing to say. And so for me, that's a reason to say that this first view is, uh, is false. Now, there's more to say here, but um, like I said, I'm just summarizing the tip of the iceberg. What about the idea that everything is valuable to the highest degree possible? Well, once you have degrees, like the mosquito, there's no way you would think that everything has the highest degree because things go up and down. So you can't go there. What about the idea that some things have it and other things don't? That's the third possibility. This view raises a problem I like to call the cutoff question. Where do you cut off the intrinsic value? Where does it stop? Right? If some things have it and other things don't, where, where does it go? Where does it end? And I think this is a really hard problem. And you can see a lot of philosophers have tried to answer this question through history. There's one article that goes through 33 attempts to try to do this, and they all fail. And they fail badly. It's like, uh, they're, they're just, there's, there's, no, there's no good uh, account here. And I won't go through all these possibilities. You'll recognize some of these philosophers. I won't read these slides, but here are some famous attempts to say what distinguishes humans having intrinsic value or having moral considerability from everything else in the universe. You know, here's Kant and then uh, some other philosophers, Tom Regan, Good Pastor, Taylor, Peter Singer. The reason why I think they're all wrong is a different argument that involves the annihilation machine. Let me go back to that. And instead of my daughter in the machine, let's suppose we just have a rock. So everybody knows, everybody knows rocks. Everybody. Uh, sees rocks all the time. They're everywhere, sometimes too many of them. Sometimes we need more of them. Suppose we lost a rock in the annihilation machine. Now, I think you should say, so what? It's just a rock, right? Probably. But let me push you a little bit. Would a properly functioning, fully informed valuer regard the annihilation of the rock in this case, as the same as the annihilation of nothing, would you have exactly the same reaction? I don't think that makes any sense. I think if you are fully informed and properly functioning, you have to be tracking the fact that there is one less rock in the universe now. And you might say, who cares about the rock? I understand. I'm not asking about sentimental value, I'm asking about what's changed in the universe, and there's one less rock. You might say, who cares? It's just a rock. We have so many rocks all over the universe. It's true. But do you see why it's strange to me to say you would treat these two cases as the same, as identical? Because they're not the same. In one case, something is lost. In another case, nothing is lost. So I, I still think this is a problem for the idea if you can't find the cutoff, 
You can't explain why some things have intrinsic value, other things don't. Something is better than nothing. That's what this argument is called. Something is better than nothing. So the cutoff question, we can't answer it so far. Maybe some philosopher someday can answer the cutoff question. Here are some pictures from my book that are supposed to illustrate the cutoff question. If you imagine that things have intrinsic value and then somewhere between plants and animals, they just stop having that all at once. It goes from something to nothing. Do you see how weird that curve is? It cries out for explanation. What is the feature that things have on one side that they don't have on the other? It's gotta be intrinsic properties. They can't vary by degree. What could they be? We can't find them. So it seems like it's really hard to solve this problem. Uh, and for that, that to me is just a big, big reason to object to that picture. The alternative has a smooth curve that goes from something having intrinsic value all the way to nothing. And in my book, I argue that it goes all the way up on this side to God, because God has the most intrinsic value possible. So we call this a challenge argument when we say philosophers haven't been able to do this for a long time. So maybe they can't. Like they try and they try and they try, and it doesn't work. So I think we might say, uh, maybe we'll never be able to answer this question. And that seems to me to be probably the right thing to say. So that leaves us with the last view, and I think that's the best view. What does that tell us about the natural world if everything that exists has some degree of intrinsic value, even a rock? What if it has a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit? What does that mean? Well, what kind of world do we live in? If physical objects have some degree of intrinsic value, the physical universe as a whole has an awful lot of it because there's so much. The physical universe is so big, it's just huge. If God values everything that is objectively valuable, then God might value the physical universe all by itself, even if it doesn't contain living things or human beings. The value that it has by itself might be a reason for God to care about it. So usually the problem of evil says God would only care about sentient creatures who have feelings like us and maybe animals. I think this is probably a mistake. The experiences of creatures like us may not be the only thing that's important in the world. Here's a philosopher who tries to argue exactly the opposite way than me. His name is Nicholas Everett. And he says, if God had created the world with human beings in mind, the universe would look quite different. Humans should have appeared early in the history of the universe. The human universe should be scaled in human size, as it looks like in Genesis, the world seems fairly small. But instead, it doesn't look like that at all. If human beings have appeared only recently in the history of the universe, right? The universe is very old. Most of the universe is hostile to human life, so it's not a good place for humans to live. He gives us some great statistics here. For more than 99.999% of the time, there have been no humans. Most life forms are microscopic, you can't even see. The most distant star is very far. Very far. And there are roughly very many stars, right? So the universe is very big. And he says that's not what we would expect. But if the physical universe has some degree of intrinsic value, like I tried to persuade you it does, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that it's so large and so big. Maybe that's pleasing to God, just because of the kind of thing it is. Maybe it was a mistake to assume that humans are the center of creation. And not everybody assumes this, of course. Um, not everybody assumes that humans are the center. So. Now I'm ready to summarize uh, what I've just tried to explain. Um, the best evidence against the existence of God would be the problem of evil. But to develop that argument, that problem of evil, you have to say something about what God would value because you have to predict what kind of world you would see. In order to disconfirm the theory that God exists, you have to say, here's what God would do. And then he didn't do that. So you have to have some idea of what God would value if something is objectively valuable, though, God would value it, whether or not we do. If a rock has intrinsic value, God would value it, whether or not we do. 
But science can't tell us whether or not anything is objectively valuable. So science reaches a limit here. It can't help us, can't help us answer this question. We have to go to value theory. We have to go to philosophy. Philosophically, there's some evidence for the conclusion that the physical world is intrinsically valuable instead of neutral. I gave you some arguments. You may not like them. They may seem silly. That's okay. That's the tip of the iceberg, right? Just show you a little bit. There is some evidence. So if that's true, God might have reasons for making a world like ours that don't involve living creatures at all. It might be delightful to God to have a vast physical universe like ours. So what that means is that science can only provide very limited help in assessing the evidence for or against the existence of God. We have to go beyond science into value theory and other things to try to decide whether those arguments are good or bad. That's my conclusion. Oh no, wait, wait. No, that's not right. Not written by uh, chat GPT. <laughs> Oh, sorry, no, that's not supposed to be there either. Sorry, sorry about that, no. The, chat, the, uh, the program is taking over, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> not supposed to have that either. Yeah. Tasha Kudar. I, I would like to say thank you very much uh, to uh, Professor Scott Davison for his presentation. And now we can get the questions in five minutes. Ha, ben duyuyor musunuz? Tekrardan öncelikle sunumunuz için çok teşekkür ediyorum burada herkes adına. Ben şöyle bir şey sormak istiyorum. Şimdi değer kavramı aslında bilinçli olan bir varlık tarafından, bilinçli veya bilinçsiz olan varlıklara karşı atfedilen bir şey. Siz buna değer verici olarak bahsettiniz. Peki şöyle bir düşünce deneyi yaparsak, insan birden yok olsa, yeryüzünde bir tane bile bilinç kalmasa bile her şeyin yine içsel bir değeri olabilir çünkü Tanrı var. Tanrı da bilinçlidir. Peki şöyle bir düşünce deneyi yapalım. Evrende bütün varlık var olmaya devam etsin ancak Tanrı da dahil bilinçli olan her şey yok olsun. Böyle bir durumda yine içsel değerden bahsedebilir miyiz? Teşekkür ederim. The very last part. Yes. 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 Now I understand. Thank you. Yes. So the question is, um, if you take all of the conscious creatures away from the universe and you take God out of the universe too, so all you have left are the non-conscious creatures and the material things in the universe. So there is no buddy to value things in the universe anymore. So there's no God, no people. Can you have value if there is nobody to do the valuing? That's the question. Yes, I think this is a great question. And it really helps to isolate the idea of intrinsic value. So this is good. Um, I think... Maybe we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, better? Sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. So the question is, can you have value if you don't have anything to value it? So if you don't have God or human persons or other conscious creatures, can you have even intrinsic value in that case? I think yes, the answer is yes. Nobody knows that there is that value, but it is there. And we have other features that are like this in the universe, things that are there, but people don't know that they are there because they don't have the right detection. So we, you know, we discover the existence of background radiation, for instance, from the Big Bang. Uh, it was there for, you know, forever, but we didn't know until we learned how to detect it. So in the case of intrinsic value, I think we can have intrinsic value even if nobody detects it. It's the kind of thing that would exist even if nobody were there to value it. Now, if you say, I think there must be a valuer for there to be any value, I think you are influenced by the positivists here. And I think we should talk some more. So I think that some kinds of value are like this, but not all of them. So that's my answer. But I, I really love the question. Thank you. Şimdi tabii 
sunumlarımızı 45 dakika içerisinde e, bitiriyoruz. Hani e, zamana e, yetiştirebilmek adına. O yüzden e, belki son bir soru daha alacağım. Ondan sonra diğer sunuma geçeceğiz. E, buyurunuz. Aa, mikrofon bende yalnız. Geliyor mu mikrofon? Getiriyor evet. musunuz? Ben de ben de. Ha tamam. So, thank you for your presentation. I want to ask about uh, at the beginning of the, your presentation you talk about God value everything in the universe. But we when how do we know God value everything in universe? Because the description of God and the way we know about the God it's the holy books uh, and the God itself seems doesn't care about the, all the creatures at all. In the uh, Hebrew Bible, for example, he cares about just one tribe of the people. He doesn't care about any uh, anything. So how do we really know God uh, care about everything? Or we assume God actually should uh, care about everything. That's kind of, uh, there is a gap between our understanding of a God and what God described himself in the book. Thank you. Yes, good question, thank you. Yes, it, so what we say about God does depend on where we get this information about what God is like, right? So, so are, we trusting, uh, are we trusting a scripture here, or a, a, whole, a holy account? You know, in the Hebrew scriptures, when they describe God creating the world, God says it's good, and then it's very good. Um, in the Christian scriptures, Jesus says, you know, the hairs of your head are numbered and no sparrow falls to the ground without God noticing, but the sparrows still fall, they, they still die, you know. So this is a really good question. Um, the argument I gave shows that if God is a perfect valuer and everything has some degree of intrinsic value, then God must value it to some degree. But the premise you maybe don't like about that argument is the second one that I say everything has some kind of intrinsic value. So um, I think I can't prove that God values every single thing, right? Um, I think it's just the picture that makes the most sense, but I, I understand why a reasonable person might disagree with me about this and say God cares for these things but not those things. And for the problem of evil, the question is something like you raised, why does God care about these people and not those people? Why does he let these bad things happen, right? And so I think the answer to that takes us into a different question about why God might create a world like ours that is very big and full of intrinsic value, but also full of suffering and death. And that is a different lecture for a different day. But I do like the question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.